Welcome to episode 79 of the Various and Sundry Podcast. I am your host, Matt Harmon, joined live from the vault studio on the beautiful campus of Grace College and Theological Seminary by my good friend, my colleague, my co-host, and the man who has accepted Jesus as his great philosopher, <laughs> John Scott Sloat. Doc, what's happening? Yes, yes. Well, we are in the in, in the middle of summer here, and so we're actually recording a little bit in advance mm-hmm. to uh, to introduce the, the the main segment here coming up in a moment. So, uh, trying to get out in front of this, give us a little bit more space on the holiday weekend to enjoy without having to necessarily fit in a recording session. Yep. So, um, yeah, uh, I'm sure by the time this this airs, we'll have celebrated. The fourth of July in our yeah it should ways. be the the sixth of July I think yes is when, when the drops yeah. yes yes so and we will be out in Colorado actually we'll be driving somewhere on the you'll, plains you'll be out in Colorado I will. yes I'll, <laughs> I'll be somewhere in the plains of Colorado and Nebraska when this episode drops okay okay so I will be somewhere in Indiana when this episode drops <laughs> good to know believe good it to or know. not yeah it's but you'll be on the verge of leaving for your big road trip. Yeah, the the eighth. I'm heading out. Your big recruiting. Yeah, doing doing the blitz. doing the youth conference circuit through Pennsylvania, Ohio, and yeah, you are the big time recruiter. I mean, um, you know, uh, do you have boosters behind you? Are you able to offer anything under the table to these uh, high pro- you know these high priority targets? These four star five star Re- recruits. Yeah, recruits yeah yeah i just fill mcdonald's bags with cash <laughs> and and just just do a handshake agreement and that yeah. seems to work pretty well, well you did i mean you did spend some years of your life in tennessee so you know that's true that's true i'm glad you caught that <laughs> reference um no i just tell them we got a really good program that's 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 really affordable and and helps you know will help them get the ministry more quickly at, at a lower price point and that that seems yeah. pretty attractive to most yeah. Absolutely. Well, we'd love for you to connect with us on social media. You can find us on Twitter at VNSPod. You can email the show, various and sundry podcast at gmail.com. We do have a Facebook page, various and sundry podcast, as well as on YouTube, you can find us, various and sundry podcast. And we would always, of course, love for you to leave us a uh, five star rating and a kind review would be appreciated on whatever platform you use. So this week, no sports discussion because we want to make time for uh, as much time as possible for uh, our interview with with Jonathan Pennington. But uh, by this point, I think the NBA Finals should be about to start. Should be, yeah, should be going. Uh, the Mets are hosting the Brewers uh, yesterday, and uh, I've clearly defeated them. You know, yes, obviously. As obviously. as I sit here on. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> what was what, today? June 29th. 29th. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. We've clearly beaten the Brewers yeah. in a week. And, and, and you want to go week. out on a limb and try to make a quick NBA finals pick, oh, even though goodness. we don't know who's in? I mean, um, we, have, we have a guess. but uh, Whoever comes out of the West. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'm going to go with Suns over the Bucks in six. How's okay. That? Okay. Of course, by the time this airs, neither team could be in the, it in the could finals. It could so be neither. Yeah. We'll see. In any case. Um, well, uh, with all that out of the way, we want to make as much time for our interview with uh, with Dr. Pennington. And so uh, we'll just get out of the way and hope you enjoy our conversation with Jonathan Pennington. Yep. Well, it is our privilege on the Various and Sundry podcast today to be joined by Dr. Jonathan Pennington. He is the professor of New Testament interpretation at Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. And he is also pastor of spiritual formation at Sojourn East in Louisville. And you, as our listeners, will know that he is the author of Jesus, the Great Philosopher, Rediscovering the Wisdom Needed for the Good Life, the book that we've been talking about the last few weeks. So, Jonathan, welcome to the pro- to the program. Hey, thanks so much for having me, and thanks for reading the book. Yeah, absolutely. Well, one of the things that I think is always beneficial for our listeners is to get to know the author personally a little bit beyond what's on the written page there. So um, why don't you tell us a little bit about your spiritual background and how you came to know the Lord? Yeah, thanks. Um, So I, I, you know, I grew up in and out of churches, but I didn't really understand the gospel. I don't think until 
I was a freshman at a state university in Northern Illinois and a guy from Campus Crusade, as it was called back in those days, as you know, um, yeah. shared the gospel with me, the four spiritual laws, the old uh, basic kind of gospel tract. And, um, you know, they were real faithful to reach out to me because I didn't, I had really long hair and <laughs> wasn't really interested in spiritual things. Things I'm sure I looked pretty scary. And uh, so the guy shared the gospel with me on September 20th of 1988. I happen to remember. And um, that day, I my life was really transformed. And then over the course of the rest of my college, and actually for the next 10 years or so, God really provided a series of mentors who hmm. really poured into my life um, and shaped me in really significant ways at kind of different stages. So very thankful uh, for all that. Uh, Dr. Pennington, uh, just uh, as a as a follow up to that, what was it like uh, for you to make a decision to go to seminary? Was was that a formal calling? Was it a mentor pouring into you? What was what was that like? Yeah, like a lot of people uh, in crew or IV or NAVs or whatever, you know, if if they have a really great college experience, which I did, I mean, it was super formative for me. You know, I I really thought seriously about going on staff um, with crew. And my wife would have been happy to go as a missionary uh, to Asia. She had been a couple of summers with them. Uh, <clears throat> and I, so I thought about it seriously. But what happened was that uh, that second mentor, so my first mentor was the crew staff guy, but the second mentor was a guy in an evangelical free church that I was attending. And he was a second career. He was probably 40 and he had gone back to seminary at Trinity in Chicago. And so he's kind of a second career guy. And he really started to mentor me. I ended up living with his family for a little while. And he really cast a vision for theological education. And, you know, I still loved career and everything, but I had a, I was a teacher at heart and I was starting to read theology. We, we read John Piper's Desiring God in I would say, I don't know what year that came out, 90 or 91, the year it came out. And it was like, I had no idea what it was talking about, but, but um, the guy had been going to the, that the Bethlehem pastors conference started just like a little thing. And, and this guy was one of like the original guys that went to it. So he was really influenced by Piper. And so I just began to read theology a little bit more and thought, Oh, wow, this, there's just a little bit more than I was getting in through our crusade. And so I kind of faced a crossroads. Should I go to seminary or go to go on staff? And um, after working, in, we ended up working in the corporate world for a couple of years. I ended up going to a seminary in Chicago. So it was, you know, could have gone either way. And, but one of the cool things and how I've known Matt over the years is that after I finished my PhD, I called crusade up and said, cause I knew a lot of the people there and, and just said, Hey, is there any way I can, you know, give back and, and use my, you know, gifts and education. And so I started spending our summers with a crew at the national staff training. And that was, those are some of the most formative years. So crusade influenced me like majorly at the beginning of my spiritual journey. And at this crucial beginning of my professor journey, I, I would say those summers with, with crusade were just as important as my PhD, honestly, in terms mm -hmm. of just learning to relate to students, make sure I could translate my scholarship into teaching and not just kind of stay up in the academic world. So I'm very thankful to Keith Johnson and the other guys that really influenced me. So yeah, it's a great question. Thanks. Yeah. And that's really um, where you and I kind of got to reconnect Jonathan. We actually met. That's um, right. We were at Trinity. That's <laughs> right. Yeah. And uh, we met in Don Carson's advanced Greek grammar class. Yeah. 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 Sorry. I forgot <laughs> that. Yeah. You're right. Yeah. Yeah. That, I, I just had a shiver down my spine. Yes. <laughs> yes. We, and we both survived. So yeah, that's, yeah. that's, that's something we can put on our CV, I guess. Totally, but, totally. Um, I just found my paper. So I had done an independent study with him. Uh, probably my, third year seminary or something that became crucial for my dissertation, my PhD application proposal. Mm -hmm. And uh, I found the paper and cause I was moving offices and, you know, it's just funny to, to see that. And uh, oh, remember. Yes. so yes, but. very, a very similar uh, experience in my own life there. So, um, well, let's uh, let's talk a little bit about Jesus, the great philosopher. Um, what was the sort of the impetus behind writing this? Uh, what, what were some of the things that led to you wanting to write specifically uh, on this topic? 
Yeah. Yeah. And it really, really was a journey for me. Um, and it's kind of fun to look back and, and see uh, how things have developed. So I did my PhD with Richard Bauckham studying the Gospel of Matthew and I'm very thankful uh, for that for a million ways. Like I didn't really even know that I was going to go into Gospels per se originally, uh, but I'm very thankful. So then I ended up teaching the Gospels a lot at Southern and in churches everywhere and a lot of Matthew. And that kind of naturally led to working a lot in the Sermon on the Mount. Hmm. And so for many years, I taught a class just on the Sermon on the Mount in addition to uh, Matthew and Gospels in general. And when I got into the Sermon on the Mount, I really quickly realized I had no idea what I was talking about <laughs> and that it, was a, <laughs> that it was a whole world of scholarship and more importantly, a whole world of church traditions mm -hmm. um, that for which the Sermon on the Mount was really crucial. And, and so I eventually, after about 10 years of teaching that and preaching it and all over, I eventually wrote a commentary called The Sermon on the Mount and Human Flourishing. And that really reflected a lot of studying that I had done, um, trying to understand how the Sermon on the Mount sits into the, not only obviously the Jewish and biblical context, which is obviously really important to the New Testament, but uh, also a context that we have, as Protestants, and especially people in the last hundred years or so have not known as well. And that's the more classical Greek and Roman context and mm -hmm. particularly the uh, philosophical context, um, which, you know, sounds really weird. And for people that have never studied ancient philosophy, that sounds really weird. Even as the title Jesus, the great philosopher sounds really weird, probably. But what I came to realize in my teaching and preparation for writing that book and writing that book was that, that in the ancient world, philosophy was really, really important. It wasn't, kind of what it is today, which is pretty esoteric and abstract. And, um, but it said philosophy was more like, uh, Oprah and Jordan Peterson and, and, uh, maybe Jordan Peterson's the closest thing or Malcolm Gladwell, or you name it, any, you know, there were the philosophers that we know their names famously, Aristotle and Socrates and Seneca and others, they were really whole life people. They were trying to teach people how to live well. And, um, so once I understood more of that world, it made a lot of sense of the Sermon on the Mount and in, including particularly certain ways that Jesus says things like him talking about flourishing and the, which are what the Beatitudes are about and other key ideas in the sermon. So that, as I would teach on the sermon and preach on it and teach on it, you could just tell, I could tell that it had really impacted my life and you could tell that people were really like, wow, that actually makes sense. I see what you're saying. And so I, it just kind of was the natural thing to say, I need to look at the whole Bible this way and pay more attention to the wisdom traditions in the church's history and in the Bible and how really the Bible uh, is doing what the rest of the Sermon on the Mount is doing as well. It's casting a vision for a way of seeing and being in the world that is centered in, in God. Um, there are not, I mean, I'll stop because you probably want to ask another question, but there's a whole bunch of books that influence me, people that influenced me to think this way. Uh, but that's kind of how it came to be. So. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Pennington, I, uh, one, one of the things you touched on there was human flourishing. And uh, before we got on uh, the Zoom call, I just Googled your name and human flourishing. Uh, found an article you wrote on a biblical theology of human flourishing. For, Long time ago. I think it was the Institute of Faith, Work, and Economics. Yep, yep. That was, that was wonderful. Uh, I was wondering, how are people responding to that message of human flourishing? Um, it does feel like in, in, in maybe our slice of Christianity isn't often talking about that topic. Um, how, how, are, how are churches, how are lay people responding to that? Yeah, thanks. Yeah, uh, really well. <laughs> and in fact, I think, it's, uh, <clears throat> I think it's becoming more common now and whatever small part I've played in that I'm thankful for. Yeah, that IFWE article uh, was an early stab at that for me. Uh, I think there's a video out there of me lecturing on it at Southern too. So that was early and that was reflecting like I was starting to see a bunch of this stuff come together. Uh, that was so that was before the book. Um, and so, yeah, I've been talking about this stuff for a while. And of course, I, you know, it's not original to me. I mean, there, there were um, people doing this within Christianity before me by about 20 years or so, particularly Miroslav Wolf and mm -hmm. the Yale Center for Human Flourishing. Uh, there's a Harvard one now as well that I actually sit on the kind of subcommittee board for. And so the, there have been Christians that have talked this way, if, but evangelicals not as much. Um, and I think maybe I've contributed to that discussion a little bit. 
Um, but I think it's becoming more common and, and eventually, you know, the word flourishing is not going to work anymore because it's what happens with words. They get tired, you know, uh, and, and annoying sometimes. So probably eventually we'll have to, we'll all say, Oh no, another flourishing book. And, and maybe, maybe that's already the case. I don't know. But, um, but in terms of people in church and, you know, and I you know, travel all over the place and preach and teach in my own church as well. Uh, it really resonates with people. You know, um, it, of course, it all depends on how you present it. You know, it, it, sure. It, the point is not in any way in opposition to the other things we talk about, like sin and salvation. I mean, those aren't going away. It's just kind of framing, framing the bigger message of the Bible as shalom. I mean, if you want a word that's more obviously biblical than flourishing, at least in the English year, shalom uh, is kind of what we're about. That's what God's doing. It's the restoration or put it into kind of evangelical biblical theology terms, it's the, it's the restoration part of the story, mm. you know? And so, yeah, it's been a joy you know, to be a part of that. And, uh, and, and then to be connected with a lot of ways that it kind of branches in, like I said, I'm a little bit connected with some people at Harvard now and some other places, but also I've done a lot of work in positive psychology, which mm. has a whole kind of flourishing component to it. Um, and some other areas of study, some, other psychological things I've been connected with. Um, it's, it's remarkable. I'm involved with the, the Karam fel- Karam fellowship, which is, yep. was the Oik- part of the Oikonomia network that is kind of changing now. And that's all about human flourishing. So yeah, it's, it's really exciting. So. Well, one of the things that I think, um, our listeners who've read the book, uh, have probably picked up on, and even those who haven't might be interested to hear about is, when you uh, discuss uh, the Sermon on the Mount at points in there, one of the things you talk about is how instead of translating uh, the, the Greek word makairos as blessed, you advocate that instead um, we should think of it as happy are those who, and then what Jesus continues on. So I wonder if you could just kind of explain for our listeners a little bit on why you think that matters and what that distinction is trying to capture in your mind by advocating uh, for that difference of translation in, in, in our, in our Bibles. Yeah. Good question. Uh, and, you know, happy or maybe better flourishing is actually the word mm-hmm. that I kind of end up in the tra- in the actual translation of the sermon I provide. I go with flourishing. Yeah. That it's right. The same discussion we we're just talking about. And that is that uh, in the ancient world, uh, Hebrew and I mean, ancient Near Eastern as well as Greek and eventually Roman. Uh, this is what people talked about all the time. I mean, well, it's what they're talking about in Buddhism as well. I mean, it's, it's everywhere. This is the great universal human question is how do you find true, if you want to call it happiness, flourishing, shalom, peace, um, significance, meaningfulness, uh, you know, I don't know, none of those words are ideal, but that's the idea. And um, what, is very clear when you read the New Testament in its Greek context. And most of your listeners probably know the New Testament's written in Greek. And so the, it's not this kind of Holy spirit language that fell from heaven, you know Mm -hmm. Uh, it's, it's real Greek speakers writing to other real Greek speakers using real Greek words and what the word makarios, which is what's behind the Beatitudes. In fact, what the word beatus means, which is why we call them the Beatitudes because of the Latin word, um, what the word asher or ashray means in Hebrew are all the same. They all mean flourishing. They all mean happiness. Now we translate all of those in English, only in English, into the word blessed in every other language. And I've looked at 30 or so of them that I've run across. Uh, they make a distinction between blessed and this other idea of flourishing or happy. But in English, we, we've kind of collapsed those two words together. And so it's kind of an English translation problem. It's not really a biblical problem. I mean, Mm -hmm. biblical readers of the Bible in Hebrew, Greek, or Latin would have immediately seen, seen this difference. And I'm, so what I'm arguing with that is just the kind of a rediscovery uh, of this ancient idea that when Jesus is saying blank are the poor in spirit, blank are the, those who mourn, he's actually casting a vision Mm -hmm. for what the way of inhabiting the world is that will that actually is true human flourishing. And so that's something that all ancient teachers did. It's something that all ancient philosophers did. It's what Psalm one is doing. It's the same word there in Psalm one. Uh, And the shocking part is not that that's shocking to us as modern English speakers. The shocking part is what he says human flourishing is (laughs) 
poverty of spirit, mourning, turning the other cheek, you know, being humble, uh, all the things that he describes as flourishing. That's the shock. Like, whoa, that's flourishing. And it's all grounded in the fact that God has entered the world uh, through Jesus Christ, who is transforming the world and it's topsy turvy. It's paradoxical. It's upside down and ultimately manifested in Jesus' own life that life comes through death. That's mm. kind of the simplest way to say it. Life yeah. is mm. gained through death. And so that applies not only to Jesus' physical body, but also applies to our spiritual journey. Uh, that the way down is the way up. The way of death is the way of life. And so the reason he describes the Beatitudes in such shocking kind of die death terms in, in a lot of ways, death to self or death to selfishness uh, is because that's the way to life. That's how I describe it. Hmm. Yeah. Um, that That's absolutely fascinating. Um, if, if our listeners wanted to, to dig deeper into this concept of human flourishing, uh, what, what books would be helpful? What articles would be helpful um, that are out there? Yeah, I guess you could start with the thing you referenced uh, that is available on, on either Institute of Faith, Work, and Ep- Economics. It's probably available on my own website, jonathanpennington.com as well. I'm not 100% sure. And then uh, I guess my book, Summer on the Mountain, Human Flourishing. Uh, but again, Miroslav Wolf has done a lot of work on this. I mean, there's still just a lot of books coming out on human flourishing uh, from a Christian theological perspective. They're they're all a little different. You know, they have slightly different perspectives. And um, But I do try to explain these things in that book, The Sermon on the Mount, Human Flourishing. And in some ways, it is what Jesus the Great Philosopher is kind of about as well. I mean, it's a, ph- it's a vision for a philosophy of life. Um, yeah. I think I'm sure as soon as we get off the call, I'll think of some other books to tell you, but those are, yeah. Well, maybe one more question and, and maybe a slightly different vein with Jesus, the great philosopher. Um, you use a lot of pop culture references. Uh, what uh, were, were you doing a lot of research for that? Or were these just natural in your Netflix rotation? Like what, what was that like? Like my little pony. Come on. Oh yeah. Um, <laughs> the friendship is magic. Uh if you, if you read that far in the book, I guess we'll yeah. find it. Maybe you haven't gotten there yet. <laughs> yep. Um, yep. Uh, yeah, I hope it doesn't feel unnatural or contrived. I actually just read very widely and I'm just interested in a lot of different things. And uh, it's also really nice to actually have adolescents in your house. I've got a couple <laughs> high schoolers, a couple college students, a couple out of college. And I've thought to myself many times in 10 years, it's going to be hard to stay up on stuff. Right. <laughs> I can decently stay up on stuff just because I have relation, good relationships with my kids and I talk to them about stuff and I'm sure there's a bunch I'm missing, you know, I'm sure they would go, you are so out of touch, but, but uh, it does help me kind of keep up on things a little bit, but yeah, I just, I read a ton of novels constantly. Um, I don't watch a ton of stuff, not because of any kind of principle, but just because I don't have a lot of time and I fall asleep <laughs> all the time when I watch stuff. So I've begun a lot of movies and begun a lot of shows, but uh uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, the, the only intentional part of that was that Jesus the Great Philosopher really reflects a, a shift in my calling or at least a lot of my life energy that it happened when I was turning 50. So about a year and a half ago from now. Mm-hmm. And that is just a, a kind of a third stage of life uh, thing for me that happened where I'm like, you know, okay, I'm happy with my life. I'm happy that I'm recognized as a scholar or whatever else. Um, but I really want to, I want to give my last phase, hopefully 25 or 30 years still, hopefully, but I want to give that to um, making sure that I can translate my scholarship into accessible and transformative material for people. And so that there was an intentional change in my writing style. I mean, I think even my academic writing, I, I think is pretty readable because I care a lot about the craft of writing, but that this book really represents an intentional pivot hmm. towards thinking about the craft of writing. And then I had a, another book come out a little bit after that called small preaching, which if you look hmm. at that is it's a more niche market, you know, that's for, that's for preachers for the most part or teachers, but it's very much focused on the craft of writing. And so that, that, uh, I mean, like I really worked hard on crafting the essays in a good way. So hmm. that's kind of a shift that's happened. And I, and I, what, what I did, and then I'll shut up and give you more answers than you want probably. But <laughs> what I did is in the final two read throughs of it for myself, I read it to myself. And it, if, if at any point 
I found myself distracted or like wandering in my thoughts or bored, I stopped and fixed it. Hmm. So I just thought, I mean, if I'm bored reading this, if I, I'm wanting to skim a page or something, then a reader for sure is going to want to. So at any point I felt myself losing interest, I would make sure I either cut out a bunch of stuff. That was hmm. part of what I did, did, just made it not so long winded, or I added an illustration that was significant. So that I think, I hope that it was effective that way uh, for you, but that's why there are a lot of references to interesting things, I think. So, yeah, that's great. And, 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 and on the, on the theme of uh, kind of translating your work down to a level that's accessible for as many people as possible. Uh, I want to ask specifically, maybe what are some ways that uh, you've tried to implement the insights you gained from writing Jesus, the great philosopher into the realm of parenting. That's kind of a boots on the ground yeah. uh, experience. And uh, obviously, uh, we, we all want our, our children to, uh, to flourish, to be successful in the biblical sense, to love God, to walk with him faithfully. Um, so any, any particular ways that you've tried to incorporate uh, your own, into your own parenting, uh, the insights from Jesus, the great philosopher, and in your interest in human flourishing? Yeah, great question, Matt. Um, I think it probably happened more before that book. Um, I mean, it, but I, I can speak to a couple things directly from the book, but I would say that there was a shift in our parenting about 10 years ago that I've said in other contexts as well, that I think we shifted from, we have six kids, and I think we shifted from uh, a kind of idealism that a lot of young parents have uh, um, about what our kids should be to what our kids could be. Mm. And a real pivot that happened for us 10 or 12 years ago, which, re which was a function of just our own maturity, becoming a more self-aware, becoming more psychologically aware, uh, kind of growing in emotional intelligence and things like that, that we... And just a lot of idealism breaking down, which happens in your late 30s and especially 40s, um, which was really good for us and needed. I had a lot of idealism that was a little much. And so just really starting to think about how God has made, made each kid and, and rejoicing in that and letting them be different and not kind of forcing them into any kind of emotional or other kind of expectations and really focusing on trying to help them learn to enter into the fullness of their humanity. Now, I wouldn't have said it that way 10 or 12 years ago, but that's how I'd say it now. That is a function of continuing to work on human flourishing. Just a lot more concentration on human development mm -hmm. and that, that the development of character and the development of sensibilities, or we could or you just call it virtues if you want, um, that that's where what we as humans should be concentrating on for ourselves and for the brief time that we have responsibility for some other smaller humans uh, called our children uh, that we should really help them get a vision of how to inhabit the world. Mm -hmm. So that, that is what eventually kind of gets incarnated in Jesus, the great philosopher. The book is all about how to learn to inhabit the world in Christ's way. More specifically, um, I'd say the, the chapters on the emotions uh, in Jesus, the great philosopher. So as you may have talked about in the podcast already, you know, the, the first half of the book is kind of the, the story of how the Bible is a piece of philosophy for life. And then the second half applies it to three of the biggest philosophical areas, uh, emotions, relationships, and then happiness or flourishing. And, you know, those emotions chapters, those have really borne a lot of fruit in my own life and other people's. I mean, I've taught on that all over the place now. And I learned so much in, in pre preparing those chapters and writing them that really solidified and challenged a lot of thoughts about what our emotions are and how important they are and also how they can be educated over time. Mm -hmm. And that I think has increased my emotional intelligence, I guess, just for myself and for relating to my children as well. So uh, yeah, I don't know, maybe you'd want to follow up on that or I don't know if that's a sufficient answer for you, but. No, I think that's helpful. Uh, I think maybe the only um, sort of indirect follow-up would be, um, how, ha how has it shown up in, in, in your ministry in particular, maybe in your pastoral ministry? Mm -hmm. Um, 
how are some how, how some of these uh, insights or maybe not change of views, but even just your own personal growth in these areas yeah. and understanding them, how, how how have you seen that work itself out in in everyday sort of pastoral practical practical ministry? Totally, yeah, a lot. Um, again, a, a focus on virtue and a focus on human development, and a and a deep commitment that God's work in us the Trinitarian God's work of the father sending the son and the, and the spirit's ongoing work is very much about developing us to be the restoration of the image of God in us, which is the restoration of humanity. Uh, the book of Hebrews is, uh, you know, well, it's becoming more and more meaningful to me. I mean, in fact, right now I'm teaching it in the men's Bible study I lead at our church and just so struck by how much of it is about human development. That Christ is the pioneer of a new way of being human in the world um, as the God man alone can be, you know, he's the second Adam who pioneers this new way. And so that, you know, that marks a big, a lot of my ministry uh, in one-on-one meetings with people. I mentor a bunch of men too, as well as preaching uh, is that's a really important, you know, set of, it's a category and a, a grammar with which to talk with people about their growth in Christ is the, the being restored to flourish as a full human, you know uh, I'd say the other thing that has really, I think I just lost it. I was thinking of something, but the, uh, I get, yeah, I guess in my preaching, this is something we talked about at our church before already, but I've really put a lot of emphasis on, and that is what we could call the transcendentals of truth, goodness, and beauty. So if you listen, if you were to hang around our church for a while, there's two of us that preach and, and then I'm part of the leadership team. One of the things that the other preacher and I talk a lot about are truth, goodness, and beauty, and especially beauty and that idea that we're what we're really seeking to do in the church is to build something beautiful and invite people into God's beautiful ways. And that's a very philosophical, most people don't realize that, but that's a very philosophical way of thinking that I find very rewarding and really resonates with people. I mean, I can't tell you how many people have come up to us usually after a while, because it's different language for them. But after a while, they'll say, you know, I knew there was something about this church and the preaching we really liked, but I didn't, I knew it felt different than what they usually hear. Uh, not that the doctrines are any different. It's more the, the, the tenor or the timbre. And it's, it's really the emphasis you guys put on beauty. Um, so I, you know, that, that I think is being resourced largely by all of this discussion we're just having for me. Excellent. Yeah. Well, I, I can talk about, uh, talk about beauty and Jesus, the great philosopher philosophy, all day, but I think it's a time to get to the important things. Let's talk cars, coffee, and theology. All right. Um, could, maybe for our listeners who haven't heard of it, would you mind outlining uh, what, what that is uh, and, and your role in it? Yeah, yeah. Thanks for bringing it up. Um, so obviously, uh, you know, Seinfeld changed the world again, as he did back in the <laughs> 90s, but he changed the world again uh, whenever he first started his uh, Comedians and Cars Getting Coffee. And, and like a lot of people... Uh, I enjoyed watching those episodes mm -hmm. and also, um, you know, it spawned a lot of other people thinking, yeah, this is kind of a fun way to do it. And so for me, it did really, uh, and, you know, I don't know if you've ever read Austin Kleon, St Steal Like an Artist, you know, it's very, all, all creativity is, is a uh, creative stealing really. And so mm -hmm. I don't, I'm not, I don't feel any uh, remorse about, uh, you know, stealing from another artist. That's what artists do. But the for me it really was the perfect combination of a bunch of things i already love i do have an old sports car that i love to tinker around in and i also love to just talk with interesting people about their books and i've been very blessed over the last couple of decades to just get to know a lot i just know a lot of people and i know a lot of really interesting intelligent people and so i just thought i could easily do this um and so i just started it was a couple of years ago now maybe a few years ago uh, and just started recording conversations in my car uh, with uh, other scholars and writers. And we, I think there are 23 episodes out there uh, now. Uh, we did a season one and it was a ton of fun and then a bunch of others. And it's been, you know, I think relatively interesting to people or relatively popular. And then COVID hit. And of course, 
the one thing probably you shouldn't be doing is driving around in a car with somebody <laughs> for quite a few months. So we, so it, it really, and like a lot of people in my life was disruptive, but only in the sense of kind of like some habits. I mean, you know, I, we didn't face any serious illness or anything. So I don't want to be uh, inconsiderate of greater suffering that people face during that year. But for me, it was really disruptive of a lot of habits I'd gotten into of productivity and writing. And, and so we have 23 episodes out, but we haven't released one in quite a while. And even though we're kind of past COVID, it's, uh, it's, I just haven't gotten back to it. So, but I, I hope to have a season three. So if you go to YouTube and just type in Cars Coffee Theology, or you can go, we have a website as well. Uh, and there's some super fun episodes on there. Uh, I think probably the, the most popular one still is with Tom Schreiner, uh, which has a ton of views and but or he got I, I tea, just, right? He got tea that? in that episode. He got tea in that episode. I think it might have been the first episode, was it? I can't remember now. Um, but uh, and Patrick was on there then. And in fact, it, for your listeners, that we did a reverse episode uh, where Patrick drove me around, and oh, cool. so I interviewed Patrick, and then we actually switched seats uh, and cars, and because he couldn't drive a stick shift very easily and interview people uh, <laughs> and uh, not throw him under the bus. But I think he can drive a stick shift, but it's pretty hard to drive a stick shift and interview people at the same time. <laughs> and so we switched to the another car and uh, he we were, drove around and talked about Jesus the Great Philosopher. So some might want to hear uh, some mm-hmm. of that discussion as well. But yeah, thanks for bringing it up. It, it's been a really just a fun side thing for me. And uh, I really do want to get back to it because there's a bunch of people I'd still like to interview for that. So um, and then what on, on the coffee end of thing, what is the best coffee shop in Louisville? Um, because I, when I was a student, uh, I would see you at Vint pretty regularly uh, doing, doing some sort of work from time to time. So I, I was curious, what, what's, what is the best coffee shop in your opinion? I, I don't, I didn't really go to Vint that often. It must've just been a happy Providence and not super often, hmm. uh, maybe a long time ago. Uh, but maybe, yeah, I don't know. Um, we have two amazing coffee shops uh, that both have roots originally in our churches, actually in the Sojourn churches, but one is Sooner Goss and the other is Quills. Um, I don't want to make any enemies here and say which one's better. Uh, We, I go to Quills way more often just because of locations. They opened one in between my house and the campus. And then there used to be one before COVID in a, they opened one in a brand new library that I wrote most of Jesus, the great philosopher in hmm. actually. Uh, but that closed when the library was closed for a year. So Quills is where I go the most, uh, but Sooner Goss is really, really good as well. So we're, we're super blessed in, in Louisville with great coffee. So, hmm. yeah. Well, Jonathan, you're, you're a very prolific author and writer. So I know you're always working on multiple projects uh, at at any given point. So um, why don't you tell our listeners what some of those projects you're currently writing on and um, yeah, just kind of give us an update on, on, on your current interests. Yeah. Thanks. Um, I am embarrassingly overdue on the pillar (laughs) commentary on Matthew. Well, I wasn't going to bring that up, but (laughs) you know, in fairness, in fairness, um, (laughs) the, the editor of that series who shall not remain nameless, Don Carson is also notoriously late on some other, some of his own projects. Thank you. (laughs) So (laughs) I wasn't going to bring that up with him either, but (laughs) the thought has crossed my mind. (laughs) Yeah, no, but I, I really do want to get that done. I mean, it was an honor for Don to invite me into that excellent series. Mm-hmm. And also just, I feel embarrassed that I'm overdue. And what, part of what happened is that the Sermon on the Mount sucked me into its vortex and I spent five <laughs> years writing that book. I mean, really, which obviously contributes to my understanding sure. of Matthew, but I I had to figure that out. Like once I started mm-hmm. going into the Sermon on the Mount, I could not leave it till I wrote that book and figured it out. So that's that's what slowed me down, but you know, that's also kind of an excuse because I've done lots of other things between two cents. But uh, yeah, that's the biggest thing I need to really work on. I also have a book that I'm nearing completion. Hopefully it'll be done this summer. Uh, another editor uh, who many of us would know would be happy for me to get it done. Uh, a book with Crossway on kind of how to study the Bible at a pretty accessible level. But I think the, you, and there's so many good books out there like that. I mean, so sometimes I have panic balls, like, why am I doing this? And there's so many good books on there, but I think the contribution I'll be making to it, I hope is that I do a lot of 
thinking and working and epistemology, which we will, I won't even use that word in the book, but the questions of how do we know things? And, Mm -hmm. and I'm very interested in that discussion uh, and issues related to um, metaphor, uh, metaphors and language uh, issues related to uh, cognitive linguistics is usually to semiotics, bunch of stuff that I won't use any of those words in the book, but I, I have these little vignettes peppered throughout the book that kind of explore issues of how do you know things? And, and so I, you know, I'm pretty excited about that book. Um, hopefully be done with it this summer. Uh, and then I have some other contracts that are out there that aren't overdue yet. Um, that I, I'm hoping this is just, you know, raw here, but I'm hoping, so I, I need to write a, another book um, kind of to follow up on Jesus, the great philosopher. And at this point, the idea is to write a book called the art of living. And again, that's super tentative, mm-hmm. uh, but it's kind of taking the second half of Jesus, the great philosopher and writing a whole book that just explores more topics about what the Christian philosophy would say. So I'd like to do a little bit more on friendship. I've done some more work on that since writing that book. Uh, Just this weekend, I was in Dallas, and one of the talks I gave there was on vulnerability, Uh, kind of taking some of the Brene Brown stuff and going farther with it kind of biblically. Um, So that's what I've been toying around with is this uh, a little book of touching on a bunch of topics, work, you know, sexuality, whatever else, Mm -hmm. and say, what is the, if you understand Christianity as a philosophy, what would it have to say about these things? So we'll see. Okay. If we get to that. Yeah. Very cool. Excellent. Well, uh, this is sort of the last question here, but um, if, if our listeners just want to kind of keep track of what you're doing, what are some ways they can connect with you or kind of follow along um, and, and keep tabs on, on what, what God is doing through you and what you're interested in? Yeah, thanks. Um, so I do have a website, uh, jonathanpennington.com that has, that I pay my daughter to maintain because <laughs> I have time to maintain it. Uh, that is actually run by a nonprofit ministry that I am a part of called Human Flourishing Ministries. So, I mean, I, I am the ministry, but I mean, it's an official ministry incorporated in Oklahoma. And it, um, so that actually runs Cars Coffee Theology, uh, jonathanpennington.com. Mm-hmm. And then also, uh, so on, and uh, we call it the Human Flourishing Podcast. So there's some other podcasts called Human Flourishing. So you have to find the right one, but we keep it maintained with all my speaking, all the sermons I preach, either at my church or other churches, and then various lectures and talks I give other places. So um, yeah, if, you, if somebody wanted to find the podcast, Human Flourishing Podcast, you could kind of keep track of a bunch of stuff of speaking engagements. So. Okay. And you are on Twitter too. I am on Twitter. I was just talking to my daughter about it today. Like, is this, I mean, I, I don't, <laughs> I stay out of everything. I don't get into any controversies, but Twitter is not a very happy place. I realize. I mean, I'm happy on there, but right. most people aren't happy on there. And so, uh, but yeah, so that's probably the place where I'm most active in social media. So uh, Dr. JT Pennington, I think is what it is. Uh, there's also a Facebook page. It's kind of generational, you know, there's, yep. and, I, and I see it in my house, Facebook, yep. a little younger Twitter, a little younger Instagram. And then my youngest, it's TikTok. So the, the only of those I don't have is TikTok. So <laughs> knock on wood, I don't think I'm going to have a TikTok account. So but we shouldn't expect any uh, dancing videos from you probably coming not, out on TikTok. Okay. But I may eat my words. That may be, <laughs> I'll have to come back on and apologize that I am now a huge TikTok talk star but, uh, <laughs> yeah that's so i am on facebook uh instagram so instagram as well and and uh, twitter probably but for whatever reason i'm most active on twitter probably gotcha well jonathan thanks so much for taking time to uh to join us on the podcast we uh we appreciate your work and uh it's always fun for me to to bump into you at conferences and get to catch up with you there but um it's it's fun to think about how god is uh, allowed us to keep in touch, even though as he's kind of directed our different paths and um, allowed us to see uh, see him at work through us in different ways and in different institutions. But um, grateful for you, brother, and thankful for all that God is doing in and through you. So thanks again for for joining the podcast today. That's very kind. Thank you very much. Okay. Yeah. Good to be with you guys. So we do want to say a special thanks again to uh, Jonathan Pennington for the interview. Yes, and he's left the studio at this point. Yeah. (laughs) 
<laughs> yes, uh, we, uh, as you could tell probably from the audio quality, did that interview through Zoom. And we're now back in the studio. And so it is time for us to talk about our athlete for episode 79. John, you want to read the names of these people that you've never heard of? Uh, yes, I, I haven't heard of any of these. Um, sorry, the, uh, sorry, Gray Mamba. Um, Rosie Brown uh, is apparently a male who played uh, offensive tackle for the Giants. <laughs> uh, a safe assumption, yes. Yeah. I mean yes. offensive tackle. That's a big fella. Uh, yeah. Harvey Martin. Yeah, from 53 to 65. So we're digging back into the archives. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. With, with Rosie here. Um, yeah. Harvey Martin. Yeah. Seven, uh, 70s and 80s? Player. 73 to 83, defensive end for the Cowboys. I do remember him a little. A little bit. Okay. Uh, Bob the Greek St. Clair? No, the geek. Not the, the geek. geek. Yeah, yeah, no, he's not Greek. <laughs> well, I was about to say, you know. With a name like St. Clair, probably not Greek. Anyway. That, that was <laughs> going to be my next comment. But you're right. It says geek, not geek. Greek. I just read it too quickly. Yes. An offensive tackle for the 49ers from 53 to 63. And then why, our, why the geek? Any idea? I don't. That was know. just on the on the web page. Yeah, I, I'm just you know reading what's on the internet. Okay. You know, it, it's got to be true. It's on the internet. So okay. And the uh, Ohio State. Yeah, Ryan player. Pickett was a defensive tackle and nose tackle for Ohio State from '98 to 2000, and had a pretty long NFL career. 2001 to 2014, Rams, Packers, Texans. So a pretty. Pretty. Su- you play 14 years in the NFL. That's impressive. Yeah, these are my these are my prime football watching years. I, I recognize uh, Ryan yes. Pickett. So, out of these names that you either barely recognize or don't recognize, which which coin flip are you going to go with here? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, we could go. So, there's a couple schools of thought here. Uh, Rosie Brown for the name. Yeah. Um, Harvey Martin because you've heard of him. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the Geek St. Clair um, because of The Geek yeah, or Ryan Pickett because we know who he is. Yeah. So I didn't really narrow it down for us. You really didn't. You kind no. of talked us through the options again. Yep. But. yep. And reasons. Reasons. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I'll, I'll, I'll leave it to you. I mean I, I, I'm probably going to default to Ryan Pickett just That's because fine. he's more familiar. And, he, and in fairness, a 14-year NFL career is, is nothing to sneeze at. So – Want to go with that? That's fine. Okay. Yeah. Ryan Pickett it is. One thing you liked. Uh, there's a new ice cream shop in Columbia City last year or so uh, called Moo Over. Okay. And uh, it's it's all – it's it's non-dairy ice cream uh, for the most part and some sugar-free options as well. Do you know if my doctoral mentor Doug Moo is in any way involved in this – he Enterprise. could be he could be a angel investor of some kind. Okay, I doubt it. I do too. Um, but I think he likes ice cream. So yeah, but uh, but it's pretty good. Uh, surprisingly good for dairy free ice cream. Okay, okay. Well, for me, uh, I'm going to go with a book. Um, again, during the summers, do a lot of reading. This is a fiction book. It's called Mister Penumbra's Twenty Four Hour Bookstore. Wow, which is a fascinating. Book. It's one of those things where I found it unscribed. It's you know I had enjoyed some uh, uh, Frederick Backman books, mm-hmm. and underneath it's like if you like that, you might like this kind of thing. So it's kind of a quirky fiction uh, story about a twenty-four hour bookstore where a clerk mm-hmm. works at, and uh, there's this interesting secret society that comes in to to get books and crack a code and just interesting. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So well. Uh, we have not really talked much sports. No, nope, no. Nope. We did have a fascinating interview with Jonathan Pennington. Though. Yeah, that was a lot of fun. And we listed off several athletes that you've never heard of. Nope. And you've barely heard and of. And me, I have barely heard of them. But you know, think of this as, as an educational piece of our program. We got a little pushback on social media about – not pushback, but just noting I've never heard of many of these people. And so – In In fairness – we're at number 79. I know. We're digging through the, the offensive and defensive line at that yeah. point. And apparently I, I did look. No NBA player has apparently ever worn the number 79. Sounds like an opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. So when we get to the 80s, we're going to get some wide receivers. That'll be good. That'll, that should be a little bit more yeah. productive. So in any case, I think we are ready to call mission accomplished. Yep. All right. So all that's left to say at this point is until next time. The Lord bless y'all real good. Later. Later.